One of the wildest and most pivotal episodes in the biblical narrative is the one told in Luke chapter 1, where the angel Gabriel comes to a teenage girl in Galilee with the message, You, Mary, will conceive in your womb the Son of God. This news comes as a shock to Mary, and the Gospel writer says she was greatly troubled and confused, as she had not had sexual relations with anyone. After she voices her honest doubt, the angel reassures her that nothing will be impossible with God. So after some consideration, Mary bravely gives her consent. Let it be unto me according to thy word, she says. And at that moment, God became flesh. The Annunciation, as this episode is called, has activated the imaginations of artists since the early Christian era, when it was painted on the walls of the catacombs in Rome. In medieval and Renaissance Europe, it was, along with the crucifixion, one of the most popular subjects in painting. An enormous amount has been written on the most famous such works from these periods, which are beautiful and full of meaning and worth studying. But what I'd like to do today is to discuss six contemporary artworks of the Annunciation, which invite us to see and experience the story afresh. The first is by the Ukrainian Greek Catholic iconographer Ivanka Demchuk, and it depicts the moment just before the greeting. Mary is sitting inside her home, reading on a couch, when she begins to sense a presence. Her heartbeat quickens, and she reflexively pulls her cloak in tighter to her body, not knowing what's afoot. We, the viewer, can see what Mary, from her vantage point, can't, at least not right this second, that a heavenly visitor stands just outside the open doorway, waiting to emerge, his sandaled foot about to cross the threshold. This is Gabriel, and traditionally he's depicted as androgynous, here he holds a haloed lily, signifying Mary's chastity. To further animate the setting, Demchuk has made nicks and scratches in the painted panel. This creates a sense of movement in the air, a stirring, as if the dust that had settled on Mary's everyday routines is now unsettled and thrown aloft. On the windowsill sits a ripening pomegranate, a symbol of fruitfulness because of its many seeds. Pomegranate ornaments dangled from the hem of the Jewish high priest's robe, as the book of Exodus tells us, and the promised land of Israel is described in scripture as a land not only of milk and honey, but also of pomegranates. The fruit is eaten especially on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. In Christian tradition, the pomegranate came to symbolize Jesus's passion and resurrection. Botticelli and other Renaissance artists sometimes painted the Christ child holding a pomegranate, broken and bursting open, its ruby red juices foreshadowing his spilt blood, and its hundreds of seeds symbolizing the fullness, the fecundity, of his resurrection. The subtle presence of the fruit in Demchuk's painting reminds us that the crucifixion looms ahead, but so too the promise of new life. Artists who visualize the Annunciation must decide where to place Gabriel in relation to Mary. When he does enter her space, how far apart does he place himself? Does he kneel at a safe and formal distance, or does he come in closer for a more personal exchange? In this contemporary icon, Olya Kravchenko, another young female artist from Western Ukraine, tightly crops the scene, compacting all the action into a small round panel. The format necessitates the proximity of the two figures, but what Kravchenko has done is, rather than having them face each other, she has Gabriel whispering his message into Mary's ear. Mary's expression is inscrutable. I imagine her reflecting on what she's hearing and processing its implications. Why did God choose me? Am I really qualified to raise the Messiah? Will I even be able to teach him anything? What will my fiancé think when he finds out I'm pregnant? And my parents? Will they believe the child is God's? Will I be shunned or worse? No matter how gently Gabriel spoke and how exciting the thought of imminent deliverance, his words probably felt heavy and even terrifying, 
And my guess is they generated more questions in Mary than just the one, how can this be? Which brings me to this interpretation by Scottish artist Jessica Harrison. Harrison says that while she is not religious, she's fascinated by religious imagery, its history and the hold it has over people. She describes the accumulation of a kind of energy or force that runs through the visualized sacred narratives, conducted in large part through the artist's compositional choices. She conceived this lithograph while on scholarship in Florence as a postgraduate art student. Gabriel is represented as a giant shouting mouth with wings, his presence loud and overwhelming. Mary, whose form is based on an Annunciation painting by the French classical artist Philippe de Champagne, is small in comparison down there at her prayer desk. Her upraised hand indicates that she's caught by surprise. To me, Harrison's image suggests how the news of an unplanned pregnancy, with a child whose father is God, no less, came as a major disruption to the young Mary. It threatened not only her plans for a normal family life in Nazareth, but also her physical safety, as sex outside of marriage was a crime punishable by death and one her community would have reasonably assumed she committed. Gabriel told Mary she was highly favored and blessed to be chosen for such a role, and no doubt it was a critically important one, but in its utter uniqueness, it must have felt kind of lonely. No one else had gone through this before. Though it was scary, Mary stepped out on faith and accepted the call. She knew God would sustain her. As Gabriel said, the Lord is with you. Bulgarian artist Stefan Gorgiev shows Gabriel reassuring Mary and calming her anxieties as the uncreated word takes up residence in her womb. With one hand, he cradles her head, and with the other, he holds an olive branch, symbol of peace and reconciliation. When in the days of Noah's flood, a dove came to the boat bearing an olive branch in its beak, it meant that the floodwaters had abated that God's judgment was over. In a similar way, Jesus' coming through Mary was God's way of extending an olive branch to rebellious humanity, of initiating lasting peace. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians 1, 19 through 20, for in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I read Gorgiev's painting as the power of the Most High overshadowing Mary, that mysterious supernatural act by which Jesus was conceived, as Luke's account tells us. As biblical scholars point out, Luke's use of this expression draws on the Old Testament idea of a bright cloud that represents the immediate presence and power of God, at once hazy and luminous, both concealing and revealing. For example, the power of the Most High was said to overshadow the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 40:35. Theologians talk about how Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant. Just like the Ark in the Jewish tabernacle bore a jar of manna by which the people had been miraculously fed, so Mary bore Jesus, the bread of life, also descended from heaven. Metaphors can be drawn from the two other contents of the Ark as well, Aaron's flowering rod, and the tablets of the law. Later in his gospel, Luke talks again about the glory cloud that overshadows in relation to the transfiguration. He describes Jesus, Moses, and Elijah as being enveloped in a cloud of dazzling light on Mount Tabor. In Gorgiev's Annunciation, Gabriel's wings protectively cover Mary, and a joint halo arcs over their heads, signifying God's glory. A dark, star-studded sky is visible between them, locating the event at nighttime. But brighter than the stars is the golden light that creeps up from their feet, gradually illuminating Mary's body, the sight of the Incarnation. A sea of flowers parts on either side of them, giving way to the even more beautiful flowering happening invisibly inside Mary as Jesus Christ, 
the second person of the Trinity is being knit together from herself. Though Gabriel's touch is tender and compassionate and non-sexual, Mary's awkwardly placed hands express discomfort. This is a life-changing moment, a decision that cannot be taken back. That Mary's response to God's call was not an eager and automatic, sure, let's do it, in no way diminishes her depth of faith and devotion. She first wisely counted the cost and then determined that whatever she would suffer as a result would be infinitely worth it for salvation to be born for her and her people and for the whole world. She may have retained some degree of fear as she moved forward, but she trusted God entirely, who bolstered her up, filling her with strength to persevere. While some artists focus on the intimacy of the Annunciation, others reflect on its cosmic dimensions. In this painting, which is in the collection of a Christian conference center in Kyoto, Indian artist Jodi Sahi connects the episode with the Genesis 1 creation narrative. Just as in the beginning, God's spirit hovered over the primordial waters, breathing life into the world, so too did the spirit hover over the Virgin Mary to initiate a new beginning. In the waters of Mary's womb, the word became flesh, the firstborn of the new creation. Theologians have pointed out how in Mary's fiat, let it be, can be heard echoes of God's fiat from Genesis, let there be. When Mary says, let it be unto me according to thy word, she's essentially saying, let there be light. And by God's creative power, that light materializes inside her. In nine months time, she will give birth to the light. Sahi depicts the Trinity as a three-faced cloud overhead. Christ is in the center. His two fingers pointing downwards symbolize, the artist says, his two natures, human and divine. The Father's visage is on our left, and his upright hand with palm facing outward forms a sacred gesture known in Sanskrit as the Abhaya Mudra, which means do not fear. The Holy Spirit, rendered as feminine, appears on our right, making a Jnana Mudra with the index finger tucked under the tip of the thumb to form a circle, meaning wisdom. From this eternal community of three, the Christ descends, wisp-like, into the womb of Mary, causing her to open up like a lotus. Having received him, she blooms into her fullest self. This painting seems to conflate that mystical moment of conception with the Magnificat that Mary will sing a few months later in the company of her cousin Elizabeth, rejoicing in God's unfolding will. The figures at the right are the waters of creation personified, which rise up with Mary, bursting into praise. I like how Sayi shows Mary's yes reverberating through the universe. Christ's coming into the world's chaos ushered in a new era, his life, death, and resurrection enabling humanity and all of creation to flourish as it was always meant to. Mats Reinman from Sweden also shows the cosmos responding in joy to Mary's yes. Reinman makes his living as a touring performance storyteller of folk tales and mythology from different traditions. He has also written and illustrated a number of children's books. This painting in aquarelle and acrylics was a birthday gift for his mother. Influenced in part by Scandinavian folk art, it shows Gabriel and Mary forming a central circle, his wings curving down to earth and the train of her dress trailing up to the heavens connecting two realms. Around them is another ring formed by a tree on the left and a village on the right, where people stand in lit doorways. The outer ring comprises the free frolicking movement of birds and fish, monkeys and antelope. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, Jesus said. This vibrant, dynamic painting conveys a sense of that abundance. The circle can be interpreted as a symbol of oneness, wholeness, or eternity. Into it plunges the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove who impregnates Mary, the effects of which ripple outward. 
Mary's surrender to the divine will was an act of courage and an exercise of her agency that had a generative impact not only in her immediate context, but for all time and all places. Out of a love for God and for the life of the world, she agreed to go all in on God's plan. Her yes was the fulcrum of salvation history. E.E. E. Cummings's poem, Love is a Place, captures the wondrous expansiveness of yes. It says, love is a place, and through this place of love move with brightness of peace all places. Yes is a world, and in this world of yes live skillfully curled all worlds. God is still active in inviting us to partner with him in accomplishing his work in the world, to be conduits of his love. In this, Mary is a preeminent model. She heard God's voice and she obeyed it. She accepted a call that placed huge demands on her, but for which God equipped her to fulfill. She couldn't see the whole path, but she stepped onto it nonetheless, and God illumined it more and more each day as she continued moving forward in faith. When God calls us to a task, he fills us with the grace to do it. How do we respond to divine interruptions? When God comes knocking at our door and whispers or even shouts his will for us, and it's not what we ourselves had planned, do we listen? Do we say, God, yes to whatever you have for me? Whether it's a particular vocation or venture or relationship, that God is nudging us toward or away from. Resistance will only impede us from experiencing the fullness of life God wants for us and from giving life to others. Annunciation art can help us dwell more intently with one of the profoundest mysteries at the heart of the Christian faith, not with the aim of solving it as if that were possible or even desirable, but so that we can grow in wonder and gratitude. Artists can reveal different aspects of a story we thought we knew so well, making it more alive to us. They can also help us see ourselves in the story, daring us to tune in to the Annunciations in our own lives. <laughs>